Now, I'm trying to help us understand that we need to go big on God. That ultimately we're called to an incredible relationship with Him. We don't rise and fall on our ability to see people coming to be part of New Day. We don't rise and fall on our testimony growing in our community. We rise and fall in heaven on our ability to produce people who truly love God. Because as you'll read now, Jesus says, if you love me, you'll obey my commands. It's not the amount of people God gives us. It's our connection with him that's going to count. And that's why sometimes we have to say and preach the things we do to help each other to spur one another on towards an authentic relationship with Jesus. You experienced in worship this morning. You experienced in the prophetic words that came, in the tongue and interpretation that was given. God is drawing us to himself. And there are stumbling blocks because how does one reach God? How does one grow in God? Because if you're in this room and you've never been an achiever, this frightens you. Because what if you don't get what you want in your relationship with God? How does it reflect upon you and upon God? But the privilege of our Christian walk is God never once calls us to something that we have to do without him. Which is why he gives his Holy Spirit. Last week I talked about the early church blueprint out of Acts 2 from verse 42. Where the early church, the believers met daily. They cried out to God in prayer. The grace of God worked powerfully among them. Generosity flowed from their hearts. There were no needy people among them. The city was in awe. People were joined to their number every single day. You see, that's the dream. A church so connected with God that his presence is evidenced. I mean, that is living the dream. The problem is, as I said last week, it's easy for the pressures, the stress, the distractions, the struggles, the planning, the cares of this world to squeeze the life out of us. And if Jesus isn't central, something will always take that place. Some of us are far more devoted Monday to Friday to Pharaoh than we are to the things of God. And I threw out some comments, not wanting to offend, but wanting to challenge. Last week, saying the early church met every single day. Surely we can meet once a week. Plan your diary in such a way that you will get to a church meeting. Uncompromisingly every week, at the very least. And to make it easier for you, I preach the same thing Thursday night at half past six. Sunday morning, eight and ten, and another meeting at five. If you've got a busy weekend coming, plan around it. As much as you clock in to work, as much as you pay your tax returns, and I hope you do. Make sure you're giving God and his kingdom something, because if not, something gets in the way. We've got to live the dream. We want the manifest presence of God in our church. And we have to understand that if God's spirit is a river, there are river banks that have to be put in place to contain the river. If a guy's thirsty and wants some water or, 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 or a glass of Coke, you don't put a glass of Coke in your hand. You put it in a container. But at the same time, a thirsty person doesn't come to suck an empty container. Great. They want what's inside. A Coke bottle is sexy. Or the old ones. Remember those glass ones? I'm sure they were designed that way on purpose. They're very sexy. But Coke doesn't look that color. I mean that shape. It's just a container. Because the Coke takes the shape of the container, the spirit takes the shape of the containers. And so when we want to offer ourselves to him, we're creating some kind of space he wants us to where people can be attracted to him. There's an, it appears that there's a serious lack of the pursuit of the presence and the person of the Holy Spirit in the church today. Even in our church. It's just too sporadic and infrequent. Perhaps we're not valuing him as the person and gift he's meant to be to us as individuals and as the church. Perhaps we've even underestimated how much we need him in our midst. Jesus, 
before he left the earth, in that last week of his ministry, John chapter 14 and 16, he tells us about the Holy Spirit. Turn with me in your Bibles, John chapter 14. Or follow me in your electronic media. Or pretend to, if you don't, just, you're actually on Facebook, we all think you're researching John 14. In John 14, from verse 15, just, let's listen to what Jesus says. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. Now remember, at this point, Jesus had breathed on the Holy Spirit, breathed the Holy Spirit upon them for ministry when he sent them out two by two. But Pentecost hadn't yet happened, but Jesus is already saying, you know him. Why? Because the evidence of the Holy Spirit was already all over the ministry of Jesus. And what he was about to point out to them was that everything he did as a man, he did under the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. He's trying to tell them that in a similar way that he walked, so can they. And he's saying to them, you will see something in your midst. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, his resurrection, you also will live. On that day, you will realize I'm in my Father, and you're in me, and I'm in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who doesn't love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I've spoken while with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. Chapter 15, verse 26. When the advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify because you've been with me from the beginning. All this I've told you so that you will not fall away. That will put you out of the synagogue. And in fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they're offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. It's amazing how convinced you are in religion that you can do the most radical things and not know God at all. I've told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. I didn't tell you this from the beginning because I was with you, but now I'm going to him who sent me. None of you asks me, where are you going? Rather, you're filled with grief because I said these things. But very truly I tell you, it's for your good I'm going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin, righteousness, and judgment. About sin because people don't believe in me. About righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And about judgment because the prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears. And he will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That's why I said the spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. Now just there, I could literally preach for probably the rest of this year. Hey? Just on what you've heard right there. Jesus' understanding of the person of the Holy Spirit. So, so one of the things he says is, the Holy Spirit's going to come, who's the Spirit of truth. One of the evidences, one of the signs that the Holy Spirit is upon your life or within your life is there's truth around you. You tell the truth. 
You understand the truth. You are growing in truth. You know truth. There's no shadows of confusion around you. What you say is what you do. As much as possible. Sometimes we don't all keep everything all the time. But there's this generalization around you. The Holy Spirit will teach you all things. He will remind you of everything I've said to you. The Holy Spirit will take Scripture and He will remind you of what the Word of God says. He will remind you of what, this, of what God has been doing in your life. At times when you're facing crises, you don't know what to do next. The Holy Spirit will remind you of promises that God has spoken over your life. And then in that context, He says, I'll give you peace. One of the major Weapons of our warfare is the presence of the Spirit within us who gives us peace. And I'm telling you, where do you need peace? In crisis, in conflict. That's where you need peace. You don't need peace on the beach. Unless it's a piece of cake or a piece of fish. But you don't need peace. And by the way, peace doesn't come through an agreement. Peace comes through victory. Is that right? Peace comes through victory. Then you go on and he says, when the Spirit comes, the advocate, he will testify about me. Then he says later on, he will glorify me. How do you know that the Holy Spirit is truly growing in his manifestation in a person's life? They themselves start to make much of Jesus. Their lives aren't all about themselves. They aren't always trying to grow attention to themselves. They're trying to always point it back to Jesus. Something begins to shift. There's a reconstruction, a rebooting, if you like, in a person's life where they begin more and more and more and more to wrap themselves around the person of Jesus. He truly becomes everything in our lives. There's no glorying of themselves. He will testify about me. He says persecution will come. And I want to tell you if, you, if you're always out there persecuting everybody else, there's very little of the Spirit in you. Let's just be honest for a moment. And then he says to the disciples, I'm going. None of you ask me where I'm going. It's like, you're not even interested in my eschatological call. All you're interested in, all you're concerned about, all you feel grief about is I'm not going to be with you anymore. This is still, guys, about you. It's not about me and my kingdom. I've just told you I'm going and you're all grieved because I'm not going to be there because I'm the one who gives you your purpose. But you're not doing it for my sake, you're grieving for your sakes. That's what he's trying to tell them. But saying, listen, the Spirit will come and he'll change things in you. One of the roles of the Spirit is to make our self-absorption less and to make us concerned about himself and about his interests and about his kingdom. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he won't speak on his own. So the Bible is actually saying he will literally from the councils of heaven hear something and come and tell you. And so when you know you've heard something from God, you can take it to the bank. Because the Spirit has heard something. The Spirit doesn't speak in vain. When you know you've heard God, that word is more dependable than what you see with your eyes. And he says the Spirit will, take, will receive from me what he will make known to you. You and I can literally live in different space because of the person of the Holy Spirit within us. He's with us. You see, Jesus even said, it's better for you that I go. Because Jesus' ministry was localized. He could only speak to them when, the, when they were together. Even after his resurrection from the dead, he was on the road to Emmaus. He was at the empty tomb. He was with the disciples in the upper room. He had to jump around to be with them. But once he had ascended to heaven and once he had sent the gift of the Spirit, he could be present with each believer all the time, giving personal attention to every single disciple by his Spirit. That's your advantage today. You literally have the personal attention of the Holy Spirit who never leaves you, who never forsakes you, who's with you all the time. And what he wants to do primarily in your life is not make much of you. He wants to make much of Jesus. So why don't we often receive him? Why don't we often, we're scared. The challenge is real. I want to tell you, one of the things the Holy Spirit will always do is he will always bring about reconciliation. 
And so if you're that kind of Christian who's always fighting with everyone, you need more of the Holy Spirit. And you can't start quoting scriptures. I've come to bring a sword. Yes, Jesus did, not you. We have been given, granted, the ministry of reconciliation. Our whole nature is one of reconciling people to God and people to each other. That's why there's peace in the church. That's why if a person is an adulterer, you forgive them, you restore them. It's if they're divisive, you warn them and get rid of them. Why? Because it's the unity of the body. It's the ministry of reconciliation. It is crucial to the church that we understand by the Holy Spirit. But we're scared. We're scared he's going to change us. We're scared he's going to cause us to actually obey the commands we don't want to obey. Love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, but my neighbor is a Satanist. Love your neighbor as yourself. My neighbor has barking dogs. Love your neighbor as yourself. You're called to live differently in this age. You know the Spirit's working in someone's life when Jesus is made, made much of. But I want to just throw a few things out quickly. You've got to be careful, though, that for some of you, in your pursuit of the Holy Spirit, it doesn't become a soulish, self-indulgent pursuit. Some of us grew up in the ministry of the Holy Spirit of the late 80s, where the Spirit was being poured out. I, I've been in meetings I can't even begin to describe to you. The most powerful meetings of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, they're coming back. But I want to say this. You don't park off in an experience. Jesus never said, you used to be on crack, but i got something else for you. Because people go for their spiritual injection. Because sometimes what you experience might not be the Spirit. The Spirit is the Spirit of truth, not the Spirit of experience. Experience follows truth, not the other way around. And so, I mean, I remember when I just got saved, I went to a big meeting, thousands of people, and there was this guy moving in the Holy Spirit, and he said, oh, that block there, stand up. And I stood up with all these other people, closed my eyes to receive, and he said, I'm going to breathe on you. And watch what's going to happen. He blows on the microphone. <laughs> and I'm just waiting. And I open my eyes, I'm the only oak awake. The whole road's sleeping so to speak. And, I'm watching, and I feel like such a second grade Christian because I didn't fall over, but they did. But I'm waiting for God and he blows again on the next row and I'm watching. Some people are watching because everyone else is falling, so do they. They don't want to be left out. Just because there's an experience doesn't mean it's God. I remember another time I was at a church. I, I snuck my way to the front row. I don't know how. And I'm standing in the front row and I literally start to feel the presence of the Spirit. And I'm like, this is amazing. And I go to the pastor and I said, I can feel God. I said, how? I said, it's like this constant pulsing. Actually, I was standing in front of the base box. <laughs> I'm just being honest. And I said, I feel like the Spirit's going boom, 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 boom. <laughs> anyway. You see, our pursuit of the Spirit isn't soulish that you may just feel better. It is a benefit. You will feel. We have had times where the Spirit of God falls. People are laughing. People are falling over the floor. It's beautiful. I want us to have meetings in the next little while where we're going to have a time like this. We're just going to enjoy the Spirit together. But I can't just go for it if I haven't preached this stuff because some of you don't know what this is all about. And I want you freaking out and saying, I can't go back there because I want the Word. You get word every time you ever come here. But it's not about the word, it's about him. And I cannot say I'm preaching the whole counsel of God if I can't go somewhere because I'm scared of offending people. I'll offend the hell out of you. I've never had a problem with that. I'm trying to offend heaven into you. When the spirit comes, you shouldn't fear rejection, insecurity, or failure. If you don't experience what others seem to be experiencing, don't write off their experience just because you aren't having it. Just because some people are, seem to be more attuned to the Spirit. Can I just sit, help you with this? Sometimes the Spirit comes on those who really need it. 
We were having a Holy Spirit meeting once. And you stand up and worship, and you get a ministry team to walk around the room. This is what we're going to do. Just start praying for people. We're going to lock the doors as well so you can't hide. <laughs> Even the toilet doors. I need a toilet break of an hour. No, you don't. It's amazing the Spirit came upon them in a locked upper room. No, I'm joking. He didn't. He didn't. Don't quote me on that. It's a lie. And we're having this Holy Spirit meeting, and the Spirit of God is moving. And there's this chick at the back there. She's ugly as sin. She's a big fat thing. Hair all over the place. Honestly. This is like you look and you go, what has been seen cannot be unseen. It's one of those. And she's standing at the back there, and she has this moment. And she starts screaming. And we thinking, the boss says, do we go and pray for her? Do we go and deliver her? What do we do? The Holy Spirit says to us, clearly, leave her alone. So we leave her alone. A week or two later, another fat chick comes. Takes a microphone, asks to testify. Just as large as the other one, but looks nicer. It's the same chick. She's just beautified herself a little bit. Takes a microphone. Says, I'm a hairdresser. Three years ago, I was brutally gang raped by men. I lived in such fear of a man ever finding me attractive again. I did everything I could to make myself the most unattractive person imaginable. Come into these meetings and I'm standing at the back. God gives me an open vision of hell. With my rapists in hell. And I saw how horrible hell was. And all I could scream was, don't send them there, don't send them there. And she found her forgiveness. She found her healing. She found her deliverance in a moment because she needed it. Some of you would freak out. I can't believe all this stuff happens in church. Well, then push off. Go to some place where they're never going to bring you into the reality of the Holy Spirit. In another meeting we're having, this tall guy, Afrikaans guy, he's got a nice pair of jeans on. That's it. No shirt, no shoes, no socks. And it's near winter. He also comes to these meetings and he's flopping around. No, no, what's going on? Do we take up an offering? Do we? What do we do for this oak? Again, just leave him be. Takes a microphone weeks later. He says, I'm the youth pastor of one of the biggest Afrikaans churches in South Africa. Ministry blossomed under me. One day I was having a quiet time in the morning. God said to me, take your shoes off. This is holy ground. I took my shoes off. I took my socks off. He says, take your shirt off. I took my shirt off. He said, God, stop there. Thank God. <laughs> and the Lord said to him, you've become proud. You think you did this. I'm going to humble you. You stay dressed just as you are until I tell different. Three months. He went to the shops. He went to church. He went to work at his church in a pair of jeans. Not the same ones. I'm sure he took other ones and washed them. And, he take, and, and then one day he came clothed, asked for the microphone, told us the story, and he said, I just realized it's all Jesus and not me. You see when the Spirit comes? Then God said, you put your clothes back on. You see when the Spirit comes, there are things I can show you through Scripture that God does differently. So sometimes when you're not experiencing what other people are experiencing, it might be that they just need it differently to you. Another thing I want to say when the Spirit comes, sometimes He comes to those who just want Him more. Early in the morning will I rise up and seek you. As the deer pants for streams of water, my soul pants. I tell you, if you've been on a quest for more of the Spirit of God in your life, He will come. God gives good gifts to those who ask. Theologically, we need to see, know what we mean. Because when I talk about the Spirit coming, some of you thinking, whoa, 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 I think I already have the Holy Spirit. Yes, of course you do. If you're born again in this room today, at the moment of your salvation, at the moment you receive Jesus Christ, the Spirit is given you. He's in your life. He's there. And what does secretly behind the scenes is a work of regeneration. Then justification, sanctification, and glorification. He, he begins a work, and you see, when the Spirit comes inside you, the first thing He does is He wants to begin to make you more like Jesus. Why? Because 1 John tells us that our fellowship with God is complete because the Father and the Son have complete fellowship with each other. 
And so if we want to have that level of fellowship, we've got to become like Jesus. So when the Holy Spirit comes, he doesn't come on his own. He doesn't speak on his own. He doesn't minister on his own. He hears from heaven, and he comes into your life with an agenda from heaven to make you more like Jesus. What does that mean? 33-year-old single male Jewish virgin, in which case no girls in this room qualify. What he means by he wants to make you more like Jesus means he wants to make you mature. What is the definition of maturity as a Christian? Not if you can stand up and read all 66 books of the Bible. What makes you mature as a Christian is your ability to grow in your love for God. Jesus did everything before the Father because he loved him. Maturity as a Christian is demonstrated, John says, by your love for one another. Christian maturity is not demonstrated by your knowledge. It's by your love for one another. So when the Spirit comes and he wants to mature you to make you more like Jesus, he wants to help you love God more. And he does that through that work of regeneration. He makes you new. Then it's justification, sanctification, glorification. It begins a work perfecting you. Yes. But I also want to say that the Bible does say, Jesus said, wait in Jerusalem until you receive power from on high, Acts 1 8. So it's not only do you receive the Holy Spirit at salvation, but there are times, there are fillings of the Spirit necessary within our lives. Because we receive power that we can become effective witnesses of the gospel. The benefit, the main benefit is that we might have power to live as witnesses. And what does a witness do? A witness testifies in a court case about an event he's seen with his own eyes. That's what a witness does. So, so when we are witnesses of this gospel, when we are witnesses of Christ, it means we go into this scenario where we are empowered to live and speak differently. You're empowered to live with the Lord and you're empowered to speak as one who lives with the Lord. That's what the Holy Spirit comes to do. You will receive power when the Spirit comes on you. Every time the Spirit comes on you, He will, again, as I said, he will, He's already done the work of regeneration, so He will do sanctification and glorification. He will work things in you to make you more like Christ, but He comes to empower you to live what you believe. That's why the Spirit comes. We become effective witnesses through our testimonies of our own changed lives. The Bible says, Paul, Paul puts it like this, we are living letters, we are ambassadors. Jesus says we are the light of the world and the salt of the earth. Jesus and Paul are giving us examples of what it looks like to live as a Christian. I want to close with this. Can you imagine you are left alone on a desert island? No, that would be horrible. On a beautiful island. Maldives. There's no people around you, but once a week, an aeroplane comes and drops Woolworths packages for you. You got good food. And the only reading material is a Bible, and you start to read the New Testament. Primarily the book of Acts. No commentaries, no olive tree, no logos, no ability, just your Bible. And you read through the Gospels, you read through the book of Acts, you read through the, 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 the New Testament epistles, and you look through it. I ask you this, what conclusions would you come to about the church? What conclusions would you come to about the Gospel, about the Holy Spirit, about the Great Commission, and about your role in this whole thing? You would be so excited about God. You would believe that the Holy Spirit comes to do miracles all the time. That churches should be transforming. That's what would happen if you just read your Bible. And that's what the Holy Spirit comes to do. To show you that you're in this world, but you're not of it. And you want to go big on God. You cannot do it without a growing relationship with the Holy Spirit. He is with you constantly. In your biggest pleasure, your greatest trial. Your greatest moment of victory, your greatest moment of sin. I will never leave you or forsake you. He is with you through all of it. What we have to learn to do is to respond to him. We have to learn to acknowledge he will be with you and he will be in you according to Jesus. You are not an average person. You are not a normal person. 
The Bible says, you are in the beloved. Stand with me, please.